Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Faultishar Learning Series. Um, as always, I remind people that this is our opportunity to help all of us working in um, seismic hazard, and particularly using faults in seismic hazard assessment, that this is an opportunity to learn about subjects um, as a sort of introduction of when we go to read papers or attending meetings and get those very short 12 minute research talks. This is our opportunity to be introduced to those subjects so we can actually understand past the first couple of slides and really um, help cross disciplinary interaction. Um, Today, I'm really excited to be hearing about creeping faults and earthquake hazard, and who better to hear from than Ruth Harris. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with her work, but just to sort of give her a bit of an introduction, um, she's a research geophysicist at the USGS, the Earthquake Science Center. Um, she leads, I think, over 30 scientists in the USGS project on earthquake mechanics. Um, she's been president of the Seismological Society of America and been on the board of directors for it for over 11 years. Um, she's the USGS liaison to the Southern California um, Earthquake Center Board of Directors. And she's got a lot of medals to her name, um, including the US Department of the Interior's Meritorious Service Award, um, the UCSB Department of Earth Sciences Distinguished Alumna Award. And also she has been elected to a, as a fellow to the American Geophysical Union. Um, her work has got over 7,000 citations and an H index of 32. So she really is uh, the right person to be learning from. So uh, with that, I will hand over to Ruth. Um, she will be giving a talk. There will be an opportunity um, at some point to ask questions um, and then we'll have time at the end as well. If you do have questions that come to mind as we're going along, either sort of take note mentally or write them down, but, or if you want to put them in the chat, do, and I will collate them at the end. Likewise, if there's any problems with hearing or, or anything um, with the associated with the Zoom, just put a note in the chat and I will let Ruth know. So with that, thank you very much, Ruth. I hand over to you. Thank you very much, Joanna, for that very kind introduction and also for inviting me to give this lecture today. So I'm going to talk about creeping faults. And I realized that I actually started my earthquake science career working on creeping faults many decades ago now. And uh, probably the most popular site in the world for creeping faults is Parkfield. And it's on the creeping section of the San Andreas Fault in California. And from there, so I sometimes go work on other projects too related to earthquakes, but I always come back. Creeping faults are just so really interesting, kind of cool. And they've kind of uh, waxed and waned in popularity over the years. But right now they're having a renaissance there. They're back. So let me see if my mouse works. Nope, my keyboard's not working. And what's going on here? Hmm, we've lost power, lost control. Let me see if this works, yay. Okay, we got this. Um, so creeping faults are very uh, common in California, especially in the Northern part of the state. And this is where they were first recognized on a site on the San Andreas Fault back in the uh, the 1960s, and actually even before then, they were noticed, um, it was noticed on the Hayward Fault in California, I think back in the 1930s or so, but it was uh, best studied on the San Andreas Fault. So we have uh, many creeping faults in California, particularly Northern California, and we also have creeping faults in other parts of the world. And this is just a, a snapshot of some of the locations in other countries where we have creeping faults too. They're still a rarity, almost all, other faults are pretty much locked between the times of their large earthquakes. Um, and these, so these are pretty unusual, but they do occur in, in many parts of the world. So for the talk um, today, the actually I guess the entire talk, I will be focusing on creeping faults in California. And this is be, just because so much is known about them. So looking at the top slide, you'll see the uh, yellow stars and these denote where we've had recent magnitude five or greater earthquakes on creeping faults. Some of these faults have also had um, large-ish earthquakes in the past, and that's been recorded in the historic or geologic record. So let's go to the next slide. Hopefully this thing will advance. Yay, okay. Um, so we have really good recordings of ground motions, strong ground shaking from magnitude five and greater earthquakes in a number of locations in uh, central and Northern California. And these, uh, I guess the last, the oldest best recorded event was a 1979 earthquake of magnitude 
in high fives, maybe five nine or so on the Calaveras fault, and then another well recorded one, um, low magnitude six on the also on the Calaveras fault in 1984. Are some of our more famous ones are magnitude six earthquakes on the creeping parts of the San Andreas Fault, 1966 and 2004. Down in Southern California, on the Superstition the Superstition Hills Fault, produced a magnitude six six in 1987, and the Imperial Fault produced a magnitude six six in 1979. So we have a little bit of information about these. In the stars I'm highlighting here are the ones that have really good seismological records of their strong ground shaking. So this is a slightly scary figure at first, but I'll walk you through it. Um, so we did a study looking to see if the ground shaking, the strong ground shaking um, produced by earthquakes and creeping faults was stronger or weaker uh, than that produced on our garden variety locked faults. So in the top part of the figure, what I'm doing is comparing magnitude five and greater creeping fault earthquakes, how strong the shaking was for creeping versus locked faults. For the peak ground acceleration, the strongest ground acceleration, this is probably the most technical slide that you'll see in this talk. This, for the peak ground acceleration, PGA, and the peak ground velocity, P, PGV. So just looking at the top half, actually the bottom half is similar, just for the bottom half, I'm just talking about strike slip faults. Fault earthquakes in the top part I'm talking about um, reverse, normal, and strike slip earthquakes. So anywhere where you see a diamond, that means it's a creeping fault earthquake. Anywhere where you see a blue, uh, sorry, a red, a red diamond, creeping fault earthquake. Anywhere where it's a blue or green diamond, it's a locked fault earthquake. So you can see that the red diamonds go from magnitude five to magnitude six, six, and those were the earthquakes I was just talking about on the last slide. We don't have uh, well-recorded ground motion for larger than magnitude 6.6. We don't have that information, but we do have that for locked faults. So looking at the top two plots, anywhere where there's a diamond that's appearing above zero, above the zero line, means it's ground shaking was stronger than would have been predicted by a ground motion prediction equation. Uh, so those are ground motion prediction equations are just a set of mostly empirical relations where they looked at all the earthquakes of a specific type and they just uh, fit uh, an equation saying the earthquake was this deep, it was this magnitude, um, it occurred with these site conditions. So all these, all these different factors go into it and this is what the median ground motion should be. Um, so we use those equations and anywhere where it's stronger than expected, just above zero, weaker than expected, below zero in this plot. And mostly what you can see is those red diamonds are kind of falling within the scatter of the blue diamonds on the left, the green diamonds on the right. So what this is telling us is that the creeping fault earthquakes are not looking any different from the locked fault earthquakes. So in the above plots are for reverse normal and strike slip events and our largest strike slip events, our largest events are um, the Wenchuan earthquake in China in 2008 and then the 2002 uh, Denali earthquake in Alaska. So those were locked fault earthquakes though. In the bottom part, we're just looking at the strike slip events, because our creeping fault earthquakes in California happen to all be strike slip. So to be honest, we should only compare them with locked fault strike slip earthquakes. And once again, you can see those red diamonds falling within the scatter. So we cannot tell the difference between the ground shaking, the strongest ground shaking caused by creeping fault earthquakes and locked fault earthquakes. But this is only up to, once again, only up to magnitude 6.6, because that's the, those are the biggest creeping, well-recorded creeping fault earthquakes we have. Okay, so then we can ask another question about creeping fault earthquakes and locked fault earthquakes. Do they have similar fault rupture areas? So when they rupture the fault surface itself, so looking at the top of the figure, you see a locked patch and it's set within the creeping fault. So the question is, if you have a creeping fault earthquake, is it gonna rupture out of that patch or just kind of stay confined to that patch? How does it behave compared to how a locked fault does? So looking at the area that's um, outlined in the red, on the left, this is just a schematic that I, I'm not a very good artist, so a schematic I drew for my Reviews of Geophysics 2017 paper. On the left, you have interseismic and you have this uh, severity, this locked patch. And then in the middle, I'm just kind of wondering what's going to happen co seismically. Is it going to rupture out of that patch or is it going to stay in that patch? And do the locked fault earthquakes and creeping fault earthquakes behave the same way or not? 
So for starters, we need to get everything on the same kind of scale, because we know, of course, a magnitude seven earthquake is gonna be bigger than a magnitude six earthquake and have a bigger area. So the way we do this is to use what we call magnitude log area scaling relations. And I just happened to choose the one by Hanks and Bakken published in BSSA in 2008. I could have used another one, it doesn't matter. Just the idea is to make it so we account for the fact that bigger magnitude earthquakes, much bigger magnitude earthquakes, of course, have bigger fault rupture areas. So we get everything on the, everyone kind of on the same page or everything on the same page. Um, and now we're gonna compare our creeping fault earthquakes, the, uh, the red circles with the locked fault earthquakes, the blue squares. So we have on the vertical axis, what would have been predicted, the predicted rupture area for an earthquake of that magnitude. And then on the horizontal axis, we have the actual rupture area for that earth, for those earthquakes. And once again, we can see that the creeping fault earthquakes are falling within the scatter of the locked fault earthquakes. And also there's, once again, they're still only up to magnitude 6.6. So they're stopped, they're stopping. That's why they don't go up to the biggest numbers. But you can't tell the difference. So the fault rupture areas for the creeping fault earthquakes and the locked fault earthquakes look similar. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop right here before I go off into uh, simulations for the magnitude six, seven and larger, because we don't have the data for six, seven and larger. So we're gonna do some simulations. So I'm gonna ask if there are any questions on the topic that I just talked about. Okay, no questions. So I'm gonna charge forward. So what happens for creeping fault earthquakes that are magnitude six, seven or larger? So as we just noted, we don't have the data uh, for this. We don't have well-recorded uh, strong ground motions. We have, might have some fault rupture area information, but we don't, we don't have a lot of information about that, although we do know that they occur. So now we're gonna go into computational modeling. And there are two um, pretty well-known computational tools for modeling co-seismic, so during the earthquake, um, rupture. One is called kinematic earthquake rupture simulations, and these are the more popular ones. And then there's also dynamic or spontaneous earthquake rupture simulations, and those are the ones that I, that I use. So these, this is the way the two of them work. So for kinematic earthquake rupture simulations, and usually when you um, see a slip model produced for an earthquake, they were um, produced using a kinematic earthquake rupture simulation. So for these, you need to know the fault geometry, the rock properties, and rock properties are the shear wave velocities and densities. Also, um, if the rocks have attenuation as the waves propagate through them, if they be, uh, respond elastically or viscoplastically, so that would be included in rock properties. But for kinematic earthquake rupture simulations, earthquake source is an input. So it's already been predetermined how far the rupture will go, how big the earthquake will be, how fast it will, how fast it will travel along the fault, all those things have already been pre-decided. And all that information gets put into a kinematic rupture code and out of it, you get ground motions. And ground motions can be strong shaking, can also be a GPS and instar information, um, can, can be all sorts of stuff. But the main thing is that your earthquake source has already been predetermined. And then if it doesn't match your ground motions, then that kind of gets fiddled with in, until it does match. But for those types of simulations, although they're really good for uh, modeling, modeling earthquakes, they have some disadvantages in that they're not physically self-consistent. So you could, get, you could get like really high slip right next to really low slip, then you might know well, rocks can't strain that way. So that's not realistic, but, but your earthquake source um, model is just gonna, just gonna allow that because you've just kind of put some earthquake source out there. There are people, um, nowadays working on making those earthquake sources more physically self-consistent and that involves the next method uh, which is physically self-consistent but requires a lot more information so spontaneous earthquake rupture simulations which is this talk and is also i think earlier this year you also heard from elise gabriel and she also uses the same spontaneous earthquake rupture simulation method so for this um, method the bottom part of the slide Similar to before, we also need to know the fault geometry. We also need to know the rock properties, but we, in addition, we need to know the initial stresses on the faults if it's elastic and also off the faults if it's not elastic. And we need to know how friction works on the faults themselves. We put all this information into our code and out of it, we get the earthquake source. 
And the earthquake source that we get is a result of the interactions of the fault geometry or rock properties, initial stresses and friction. So unlike the above, where the earthquake source is kind of predetermined, the earthquake source for our types of simulations are a result, and we also are predicting the ground motions too. Okay, so say we want to do this, use this method, then what do we do? So first of all, we need to find a well-tested code. And this sends us into a quick summary and overview of a group I'm very excited about, the SCAC USGS Dynamic Earthquake Rupture Code Comparison Group. So we have been in existence for pretty many years now. And these are pictures of many of the people who have participated in it over the years. Um, some people started, um, started as group members and are still group members. And then others um, started and now they're working in industry or they're just doing other things. But it's been a really good group and our overall goal has been to check that our codes, spontaneous rupture codes are working okay. They're pretty complicated. And at least in the past, someone could um, publish a result. Even now, someone could publish a result and you would never know if it was right or not, if it were right or not, unless you too did the same simulations. So the goal of these was to go through all these benchmark exercises and I will show you a quick snapshot of them in the next few slides. And to just make sure that if everyone's using the same assumptions, everyone gets the same results. So we started in the upper left figure here. This was our first successful one, and it's kind of embarrassingly simple from a geologic perspective and even a geophysics perspective. It's a vertical strike slip fault in a homogeneous full space. So that was the first one we did, and it also had a kind of strange nucleation method that was very simple. So that was the first one we did where everyone to use the same assumptions and got the same results. Then having had that success, then we marched forward. And then two of the um, examples I wanna highlight are at the bottom of the slide. And what we were doing here is what was, was that we were testing a case where one of our colleagues, um, Joe Andrews, who had just passed away, suddenly passed away two months ago, although he was an older gentleman, um, where he was simulating the maximum possible ground shaking that could occur at the US's formerly proposed high-level nuclear waste repository called Yucca Mountain. So previous to his work, prior to his work, people had thought that the ground, the maximum possible ground shaking over many millions of years, um, so that's why we got to use maximum possible, would be about 13 meters per second. But Joe did some work simulating the geologic structure of, the, of Yucca, the Yucca Mountain region, the fault dip, and um, other features that were observed from either in rock mechanics experiments on the rocks themselves, or, um, or just uh, known from the velocity structures, and figured out that the maximum possible ground shaking would only be about three meters per second, which is still really high, but he, 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 uh, he decreased uh, the, um, the calculated value by about a factor of three. So the big question was, were well, these results repeatable? So what we did was we had, um, well, Joe Andrews actually initiated it. Um, he did a slightly simpler model for us and he tested his code results. He uh, produced code results and then we used the same assumptions that he did and we checked to make sure that we would get the same answers as he was getting. And that did, that did indeed work. And we published that in a, a seismological research letters paper in uh, 2011. In addition, we looked at different types of friction. Many of our group members use a rate dependent friction. We use two kinds of rate state friction. And we also looked at models of thermal pressurization. So that's just another type of um, friction uh, formulation or a possible friction mechanism that might occur during rapid faulting. We long, for a long time just had the 2D um, models. And then finally, um, we were able to do 3D this past year. We also looked at different types of fault geometry, the upper right figure showing the fault step over. That was the first ever um, dynamic rupture model that I ever did. That was uh, part of my thesis, my PhD thesis. And this was also the first time that anyone had ever modeled multi-fault rupture, um, dynamic multi-fault rupture. So where you have the first fault, you have rupture on the first fault, your earthquake's on your first fault, but you don't know if it's gonna get, be able to get to the second fault or not. So we did that just because I thought that was fun. Then we also did uh, rough faults right below that on one single rough fault surfaces. And then in, in the upper left, we did the case of the fault branch. And the application for that was that my colleague, uh, Jean Herdebeck, had discovered that there was a fault branch 
um, a branching fault that no one had known about before that was very close to a nuclear power plant on the Cal central California coast. So of course the owner of the nuclear power plant was kind of interested in that um, and a little worried. So we uh, were uh, tasked with doing some simulations of rupture starting on a main fault. So the main fault near the nuclear power plant was well known, the branch fault wasn't just trying to see what the likelihood was that you would have to propagate onto a branch. So we did that problem. We ended up revisiting it a number of times just because it took us a while to figure out how to parameterize the, uh, the geometry of the fault and then also to get our stresses to work so that the rupture seemed reasonable. We also looked at velocity structures, 2D, 3D velocity structures. And then um, probably our most applied, directly applied problem had to do with the 2004 Parkfield earthquake, where we checked to see if we could replicate the results of one of our group members, Shoa Ma, who had published a model of that, of that event. And we also produced synthetic ground motions at the seismic stations. Now it's like impossible to construct either kinematic or dynamic rupture model that are perfectly matched one hertz data, but we tried. But in the meantime, we uh, didn't agree um, with each other's results, so our, our results did all, all uh, reproduce each other. Okay, so so far we've test, successfully tested our codes for a variety of mostly generic ingredients. Some were pretty applied, but mostly generic for fault geometries, rock properties, initial stress conditions, and friction. And we have a number of group papers, uh, seismological research letters 2009, 2011, that I just mentioned, and then also 2018, so our most recent one, and if anyone's more interested in this group's uh, work, you know, definitely feel free to contact me. And then also we have a website that has changed because SCEP changed the websites. And in the current website is strike.skep.org slash cbws. And this, this is a list of many of our tested codes. And this is a table in our 2018 SRL paper. And the one um, that we use is one of the finite element codes for the simulations I'm about to show you. And that is the code by Michael Barral, a finite element code. It's been tested against all, with all the benchmarks and also because Michael was actually the one who designed many of the benchmarks with um, you know, group, group input. He was, did the fine details of all the uh, assumptions and description. Code is, is probably the best tested of, of them all. Um, However, many of the other codes are actually available online and have many more flexibilities are also a parallel code, so it can do uh, bigger problems. If you're ever interested in using any of these codes, I heartily encourage you to contact the authors and then for the, those that are, have information about them and resources, some of them are posted in GitHub and, and other locations, but everyone's really enthusiastic about their code. So if they're still working in geophysics, they would be uh, very happy to help you use their code or just discuss their code. And I should mention that some people had codes that were developed early on and they didn't work quite as well as they wanted them to. So then they've abandoned their own codes and are now working using other people's codes. So anyway, the group is uh, very collaborative and works together really well. Okay, so now we have our finite element code, our spontaneous rupture code to use. And this uh, fault mine is published, uh, described in Michael Burrell's GJI paper published in 2009. Next, let's choose a creeping fault region to study. So this lands us in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we have the well-known San Andreas fault, that's the kind of pinkish um, fault, 22% probability. And there's a 72% probability of one or more magnitude six, seven or greater earthquakes in the current 30 year period, 2014 to 2043 in the San Francisco Bay region, which is home to about 6 million people. So the San Andreas is pretty famous, um, but there are also plenty of other faults with high-ish high probabilities. And these include outlined in orange, the Rogers Creek and Hayward faults, and then in purple, the Calaveras fault. The Rogers Creek, Hayward and Calaveras faults are all creeping faults, as are some of those faults that are outlined in blue. Some are all of those faults outlined in blue. So the San Andreas in this section of California is actually locked, but many of these other faults are creeping. The Rogers Creek, Hayward, and Calaveras fault have all had earthquakes in geologic time that we know of, um, and some of them in historic time too. The Rogers Creek fault, the most recent large-ish events, so it was observed in trench 
uh, was in the 1700s, work by my colleague Suzanne Hecker, and then um, it published in the 2000s, and then uh, also studied by David Schwartz and Karen Budding in, er in the early um, 90s, 1990s. So we know it's had large earthquakes. The Hayward Fault is perhaps the best studied of all of these, and there's a record of at least 12 large earthquakes with a recurrence interval of about something like 150 years. The last large Hayward earthquake was in 1868, so before we had seismological recordings, um, but there's uh, some other evidence of the ground shaking effects from 1868. The Calaveras Fault is the only one that's had a creeping, a large earthquake on a creeping fault. The earthquakes weren't super big, um, but they were quite noticeable that were recorded by seismological um, instruments. And this is the 1979 and 1984 events. And then the Calaveras Fault in the next figure you'll see is there's the main, main um, the Calaveras, and then there's also the Northern Calaveras. And it too has a geologic record of having at least one um, earthquake in the past. Okay, and this is just showing you some a sketch or sketches of damage to the city of San Francisco from the 1868 earthquake on the Hayward Fault. It was about a magnitude 6.8 or so. And before the great 1906 San Francisco earthquake, this earthquake was actually called the San Francisco earthquake just because it had done so much damage to the city of San Francisco. And this is a kind of more modern day. Um, this is just showing you the effects of Hayward Fault Creek. Not sure if the creek itself is what closed the school or if that was just a coincidence, but having a, fault, a creeping fault going through your building is probably not that good for the building as we know, we do know that well. And in the bottom, this is not, doesn't look super dangerous or anything, but this is just showing you the creeping Hayward fault going through a park in the city of Hayward and how this uh, wall was offset by the fault creep. Okay, so now we have our spontaneous rupture code. And now we wanna figure out the correct ingredients for our simulations of Rogers Creek, Hayward Calaveras and Northern Calaveras dynamic rupture simulations. So now we need to figure out what we should use for the fault geometry, what we should use for the rock properties, what we should use for the initial stresses and what we should use for the friction. All right, so here's the map showing you quaternary active faults in the San Francisco Bay area. We see our famous San Andreas fault, we see San Francisco, many people, when AGU is in San Francisco, go to that location. San Francisco is a pretty well-known city. And then just uh, to the right of the star indicating San Francisco, there's the city of Oakland, which the Hayward Fault does go right through. It also has a pretty um, big population. And the biggest city in this area is actually San Jose, denoted by the SJ, that has a population of more than a million, a million people. So this whole area has about 6 million people. We see the faults outlined in orange, and then in blue are the faults that we're gonna model for this. So we have the Rogers Creek Fault. It actually goes a little farther north than our model, but we kind of ran out of room on our computers. So we already have a 196 kilometer long fault system and we need to extend it farther north in the future. And that is one of our plans. The fault creeps north of SR, north of Santa Rosa, but south of there, the Rogers Creek Fault doesn't, doesn't creep as much. You see something labeled CF, which we're going from Northwest to Southeast. And that is a, a connector fault that was identified by my colleague, Janet Watt and her co-authors. And that's kind of important for our model because this connector fault goes between the Rogers Creek and the Hayward. Long ago, we thought that there was a kind of a gap between the Rogers Creek and Hayward faults. And that would have made earthquakes, made it pretty difficult for an earthquake rupture to jump across. But now that we have this connection between the two, that makes it much easier for ruptures to propagate from one fault to the other, or even to nucleate in the middle and propagate both ways. So we have the Hayward fault that we've just been talking a, a little bit about, the Calaveras fault, and then there's a branch, the blue, the light blue color to the Northern Calaveras fault. So that branch is kind of tricky to model, in our with our fault geometry and it's also actually really complicated it's a really complicated fault geometry that we had to simplify for our models and i'm not even sure how well we uh, totally understand the geometry the fault geometry and depth in general so this is definitely a topic of current study on, and a lot of really great work on this is um, going on including by my colleagues uh, russ gramer russell gramer and others all right, so here is our 3D fault geometry that we use. 
Uh, we see the Rogers Creek Fault, a connector fault I was just mentioning, the Hayward Fault, and I just highlighted here Point Pinole. You'll see it on some of the figures labeled P, P, as PP. And this just does is our zero, our zero point in our in our model, and it's also the location of some the start of a fault bend. We have Hayward Fault with Central Calaveras Fault, and then we have this branch that's the Northern Calaveras Fault. So the fact that there's a branch does indeed make it harder for ruptures to propagate. It makes the whole geometry a lot more complicated. And in the lower right is the 3D finite element mesh that we use. So this is definitely a 3D model. And we have about 60 million elements in our mesh. For our simulations, we'll be looking at earthquakes nucleated on the Rogers Creek Fault, earthquakes nucleated on the Hayward Fault, earthquakes nucleated on the Central Calaveras Fault, and earthquakes nucleated on the Northern Calaveras Fault. And those circled and circled stars um, tell you, show you where the nucleations will be. Next, we need to figure out our rock units. And we're really lucky um, for this area in that there's a very good, geo, well, relatively very good compared to most other regions. Um, there's a really good 3D geologic model. There's a 3D rock properties model. And these are showing you horizontal slices through these models at 140 meters depth as shown on the left. And at seven kilometers depth as shown on the right. So of course we know more about what the geology looks like in the that's cl closer to the Earth's surface. And we know a little less about it as it gets deeper, but we still do know some. And the white kind of faint lines that you see here are showing you the fault, um, the fault surface at, at those depths. So in the past, um, the previous slide, you saw this kind of a side view of the 3D fault geometry in here. Now we're looking at it in, in a plan view. So looking at it from above. You'll notice that there are different kinds of rocks that are abutting the faults in different places. And in the next slide, we're gonna kind of see a side view of these faults. But in the meantime, these rock units are used in, in, in combination with uh, some equations that were put together by my colleague, Tom Broker, published in, I think, 2008, maybe 2005. Anyway, uh, published in the mid 2000s, where he says, if, if you have a rock unit, this, this rock unit, then at this specific depth, this is what the shear wave velocity will be and the density will be. So we use the broker equations in combinations with this 3D geologic model. Okay, now let's look at a side view. As I said, we'd have different rocks abutting the faults on um, different sides of the fault surfaces. So these are views of the fault surfaces themselves with depth on the vertical axis and a long strike distance on the horizontal axis going from the Rogers Creek connector, Hayward and Central Calaveras Fault. And before, remember I was mentioning PP, and that's Point Pinole, that's at zero kilometers along strike. On the top, you see the east side of the rock, of the rock, of the surfaces, the rock units. And then on the bottom, you see the rock types on the west side of the fault surface. So mostly we wanna know, well, first of all, is there a velocity contrast across the fault? but also we use this information to determine our fault friction. So see that big orange rectangle in the middle on the Hay along the Hayward Fault, and that is the San Leandro Gabbro, and that happens to be one of the strongest fault rocks in the area. Right next to it, we see serpentinite, and that happens to be one of the weakest fault um, rocks in the area. But they don't um, evenly abut across the fault, so then we have to figure out how to deal with that fact that we have a contrast. But fortunately, some Rock Mechanics Lab experiments have figured out what to do with that and that we use the weaker, we, the weaker rocks when a strong uh, fault and a weak fault, oh, sorry, a strong rock and a weak uh, rock meet each other across the fault. So that's the main fault surface. And then the same thing we have for the Northern Calaveras Fault, that uh, fault branch. There, um, the rocks are a little bit more similar, but you can see the different rock types on each, each face of the fault. Now we have those same figures. And this on the and the top half, and then on the bottom half of the slide is just showing you how that translated into shear wave velocity. So we have the, the dark red, that San Leandro Gabbro is a really high shear wave velocity on, uh, on the east face of the, especially of the, Hay of the Hayward Fault. Okay, now we need to figure out what to do with fault friction. So for fault friction, we choose slip weakening. It's the most common, most popular type of uh, friction formulation. 
And because we're only looking at the co-seismic period, only looking at the earthquake itself, it is fine to use slip weakening. If instead we are looking at what happens after the earthquake, looking at post-seismic slip, or even looking at inter-seismic slip at the time between large earthquakes, then we would not be able to use slip weakening. Instead, we would use, need to use some rate-dependent friction formulation instead. But because we're just looking at co-seismic, slip weakening is fine. For slip weakening, the coefficient of friction depends on how far a point on the fault has slipped. We need to know the static coefficient of friction, the dynamic coefficient of friction, and then what we call the slip weakening critical distance. And this, the slip weakening critical distance just is how far the fault has to slip before you go from um, static, linearly decrease from static to dynamic friction. So this is kind of like Coulomb friction, just a little bit different because it has one or two more parameters than Coulomb friction does. All right, so we need to figure out our static dynamic coefficients of friction. Fortunately, our dynamic coefficients of friction are figured out for us. And this was um, done in lab experiments on rock samples that were collected at the surface, at the Earth's surface on the Hayward Fault. And this was work done by my now retired colleague, uh, Carol Morrow, with our not retired colleague, uh, Dave Lochner, and uh, Emerita scientist, Diane Moore. So they did, um, did experiments on these rocks, and they also did experiments on similar rocks that appear in the San Andreas Fault Observatory at depth at Park, uh, north of Parkfield in the creeping section of the San Andreas. So the main thing is that the San Leandro Gabbro is much stronger than the other rocks and even has a higher sliding friction and also higher static friction, and the serpentinite is weaker. And then the other rocks are kind of more similar to each other in their friction behavior, so we kind of give them, assign them an, an average uh, value for their Dynamic coefficient of friction to get static coefficient of friction, we use a relation by Teng Fang Wang published uh, a while ago, where he said that static friction is about 20% higher. Okay, lastly, we need to figure out our initial shear stresses. So we assume a constant normal stress on the fault surfaces because we don't know what else it should be. And then for our initial shear stresses, we assign them based on whether parts of the fault are creeping or locked. So for the same rock type, higher initial shear stresses are assigned, is are assigned to the lock patches and lower initial shear stresses are assigned to the creeping patches. So that means we need to figure out what the pattern of fault creep looks like. This is, once again, depth. This is on the fault surface itself. Rogers Creek, Connector, Hayward, Central Calaveras, going from zero down to 14 kilometers. And then the Northern Calaveras Fault too below. The Northern Calaveras Fault um, is a little bit of a deeper, slightly deeper fault. It goes down to 14 kilometers. The others don't go down quite as deep. So we have creep, creep rate or slip rate, interseismic slip rate information from Estelle Chaussard's JGR 2015 paper. And she gave us information for the Northern Calaveras Fault, which is super helpful. And then also for the Central Calaveras in the Hayward Fault, which is also really useful information. But then we don't have it north of there. But Gareth Funning and his... Um, who was then his postdoc supervisor, Roland Bergman, did have a model of the Hayward Fault. And then Gareth Funding has a model of the Rogers Creek Fault that's a little bit north of where our study area is. So Gareth, our co-author on this work, he helped us put together a model for the whole fault surface going from Central Calaveras to Hayward connector to Rogers Creek. So anywhere um, where the faults are creeping interseismically at three millimeters per year or faster, we said, okay, that means it's actually creeping. And then we assign a lower initial shear stress. But three millimeters per year is kind of a little bit of an arbitrary number. I was thinking that if it's three millimeters per year or faster, then it's not gonna be three millimeters plus or minus three. So it's actually gonna be creeping. Um, but just to make sure it wasn't too arbitrary, I also looked at where is it creeping at one millimeter per year or faster? Because that would give you a bigger creeping area. So that just determined where we had higher and lower initial shear stresses and also how um, the proximity to failure relates to the stress drop. So creeping sections are harder to propagate through and locked sections are easier to propagate through. Okay, so we have our fault geometry, rock properties, initial stresses and friction, and we also have our code. So let's go look at some scenario large earthquakes. So now we're back at this figure again. And we have Rogers Creek nucleation. We're going to nucleate there. We're going to nucleate on the Hayward Fault. We're going to nucleate on the Central Calaveras. And we're going to nucleate on the Northern Calaveras. 
Now, each time we nucleate a rupture, we don't know if it's going to make it beyond that nucleation region because if we force that nucleation, but then is it going to propagate or not? So that's the thing about spontaneous rupture. You have it predetermined how far that earthquake is going to get. So you just have to find out based on the initial conditions that, that you've assigned, you find out what happens. All right, so first, for starters, I call these the locked scenarios. So this um, assumes that we don't know anything about the fault being a creeping fault, these faults being creeping faults. We just think, oh, they're just regular faults. Left side of the plot, going from top to bottom, left side of the figure, going from top to bottom. We have Rogers Creek nucleation, Hayward nucleation, Calaveras nucleation, and then Northern Calaveras nucleation. Okay, let's go back to the top left, the top left figure. Each of these uh, lines that you see or curves that you see is a contour that tells you at what time that part of the fault ruptured. So we're doing it in one second intervals. We start it in the Rogers Creek nucleation area. And then every one second, you're gonna see another contour curve. So we see after maybe, a, I can't quite tell, 15 seconds or so, um, the rupture gets to the Northwest end of our Rogers Creek model. And then after a whole bunch of seconds, maybe 100 seconds or so, we're getting all the way down to the southeast end. So Rogers Creek nucleation propagates both to the northwest and to the southeast. This is for a locked fault scenario where the initial stresses or shear stresses are the same, um, irrespective of creeping or locked. Now we're going to do the same thing. Now we're going to go down and we're going to look at the Hayward nucleation. So it's now it's nucleating at minus 40 kilometers along strike. And wherever you see the contours really close together, that means that it's being really slow. So it's taking it a while to get out. So it takes a little while to get out of the nucleation area. And then wherever you see a, like a bigger space between the contours, it means it's going kind of fast. So the contours at, are at one second intervals and sometimes a second takes, uh, it takes it a lot while to get very far during that second. And sometimes it sprints ahead during that second. So we see it propagating to the Northwest. It makes it all the way. It's having some difficulties, but it makes it. And then similarly, it makes it all the way to the Southeast. Now we're gonna nucleate on the Calaveras fault. Also has a little difficulty getting out of the nucleation area, but it makes it all the way. In some places it's kind of sprinting forwards, other places it's kind of slow, but makes it all the way to the Northwest and Southeast. And in this case for Calaveras nucleation, it actually triggers the Northern Calaveras fault, that fault branch, it actually triggers a little bit, but then stops. Then last, Northern Calaveras nucleation, so for all the different runs we did for the Northern Calaveras fault, it always propagates all over the Northern Calaveras. It never gets stopped. So here, in this case, it, it ruptures the entire, that entire fault branch, jumps across, but it takes it a while. So you see those bunched up in the, very, the bottom left figure. You see those kind of bunched up contours. It takes it a while, but it is able to make it onto the main fault, to trigger the main fault, make it along the main fault, and then rupture from all the way to the southeast end to its uh, northwest end. On the right side, we see the final slip. And the maximum slip here is six and a half meters, which is a lot. Uh, this is the max, these um, simulations are the biggest earthquakes that we produce. And the Rogers, Kirk, Rogers Creek uh, nucleation one is the biggest one overall. Final slip for the Rogers Creek is up to six meters, six and a half meters, it's kind of high. I, and the slip that appears here, the slip patterns that appear are related to the velocity structure, also to the friction coefficients that we used and to the fault geometry. So all of those are playing a role in these, in these simulations. Okay, so this is locked fault, maximum possible, pretending that there's no fault creep at all. That has no effect. And then just some snapshots of ground shaking at the earth's surface 15 seconds and 30 seconds after each nucleation and um, the, the peak is actually a little higher than one and a half, it's kind of capped, but you have also had the strongest ground shaking at the earth's surface due to those scenarios. Okay, now let's say we do know that the fault is creeping and we're gonna use the three millimeter per year contour to say where um, those parts of the fault, so anywhere where it's creeping at three millimeters per year or faster, um, then we are gonna say that's a creeping patch and we're gonna have lower initial shear stresses. All right, so in these figures, just looking at the left side, the shaded parts of the figures are those creeping patches. So anywhere where it's shaded is showing where you're creeping at three millimeters per year or faster, 
And that means that we have lower initial shear stresses there. So let's look first, top to bottom on the left side of the figure. Rogers Creek nucleation propagates successfully to the Northwest, doesn't have far to go. Um, it gets a little stuck as it's going to the Southeast. You'll see the contours kind of bunched up around Point Pinole, PP at zero kilometers along strike. It does make it through there, propagates, gets a little stuck around 60, minus 60 kilometers along strike or 70 minus 70 kilometers long strike, makes it through and then makes it almost all the way to the Southeast end, except the contours are all bunched up. It kind of gets stuck right before it makes it to the end. So the creeping parts, probably because they got deeper there, do impede it right near the end. Next one down, Hayward nucleation, propagating to the Northwest. You see around, once again, around Point Pinole, getting a little stuck there but does make it through, makes it all the way to the Northwest end. I'm going to the Southeast. It makes it down to about minus 120 kilometers or so, 100 and, sorry, 110 kilometers um, before it gets stuck. It tries to make it through the creeping patch, makes it a ways, but then stops. Central Calavera, so not showing that plot because it nucleated, but didn't go anywhere. So as I said, with spontaneous rupture, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna be able to propagate um, all the way, it, it, it depends on if the initial stresses are are sufficient and the propagating waves and stress waves allow you to go or not go. Northern Calaveras always propagates no matter what. And I think it's because its creeping patch is pretty small relative to its uh, fault, the whole fault region. It propagates and triggers, lightly triggers the main fault, but then that stops. Right side of the plot, you'll see the final slip. And this final slip is now less than it was in, in the last uh, slide. And then ground motion for Rogers Creek, Hayward, and Northern Calaveras nucleation, and it, it too is lower than in the last one. Now let's look at the one millimeter per year contour. So now we have the biggest um, fault creep area, the area defined by slipping faster than a millimeter per year interseismically. And these, this is the shaded region. Once again, it's the creeping area. So now you'll see the creeping area is much bigger than it was on the previous slide. We have Rogers Creek nucleation, always makes it to the Northwest end, nothing to stop it. Um, it has some difficulty as it's getting towards kilometer zero, point null, does manage to make it through, although it's kind of slow. Um, there's a little lock patch there that helps it go a little bit farther, but then it gets stuck and stops. So it makes it onto the Hayward Fault, but doesn't propagate. Actually it does propagate pretty far, but not all the way. It definitely gets nowhere near the Central Calaveras Fault. I'm not showing a Hayward nucleation because it nucleates but can't propagate. It's unable to. I'm not showing a central Calaveras nucleation because it nucleates but is unable to propagate either. And I am showing northern Calaveras nucleation because, as always, it nucleates and then propagates all over on that fault branch. And then to the right, our final slip, and it too is less than the last, the, it's less than the last uh, two, two uh, cases. So either fully locked or three millimeters per year. Snapshots of ground shaking. All right, now we're going to do a preview of the movie, and I'm hoping the movie's going to work. But I got I got uh, enthusiastic last night and thought I'd be successful, so we'll see. See if this goes. All right, so this is the case we're going to look at. The creeping falls three millimeter per year, which you saw two slides ago. And here I'm also going to add some cohesion. So cohesion, if you do like simple Coulomb failure, know that the shear stress in order to fail in order to slide, your shear stress has to exceed your coefficient of friction times your normal stress plus cohesion. So that's the kind of cohesion I'm using here. And the reason to put some cohesion is, in yeah, is dynamic rupture models, because the Earth's surface is a free surface, often kind of tends to blast towards your surface, produce way more slip than might be expected in nature, and then also sometimes go super shear. But we, we didn't have that problem of super shear, unexpected super shear in ours. And super shear just means your rupture is going faster than the shear wave velocity. It's kind of fast. Um, so often in dynamic rupture models, if you don't do anything, then you might get too much slip, too much action right at the Earth's surface that's generally not observed in nature. Instead, in nature, we have all sorts of complexities at depth and near the Earth's surface that might tamp down this behavior. So I'm going to try to deal with that by putting in in the upper three kilometers of the fault surfaces, put in three kilometers of cohesion um, in, and uh, put in two, uh, two MPA of cohesion and just taper it down a bit. So this is now including not only the three millimeters per year contour of creep rate outlined in the shaded areas, 
but also a bit of cohesion in the upper few kilometers of the fault. So we have Rogers Creek nucleation, propagates to the northwest, gets a little stuck around Point Pinole, probably due to that fault bend there, but makes it through the creeping section, makes it a little ways, and then just kind of gets stuck just after it gets onto the central Calaveras fault. Next, we have Hayward nucleation, and that's the movie I'm going to show you. So we have nucleation on the Hayward fault at minus 40 kilometers long strike, barely makes it out of the nucleation area, propagates along, and then encounters the fault creek, and then it's kind of stopped to the northwest, makes it a little ways through the fault creek, and it also gets a little bit stuck and doesn't quite make it to the central Calaveras. So we're going to see that movie. And then Northern Calaveras um, fault is always, always propagates. And then this one also triggers a little bit. So let's go see if I can get the movie to work. All right, one thing to notice is uh, when my colleague was making this movie, he flipped Northwest to the other direction. So uh, Rogers Creek fault, Point Pinole, Hayward fault, and Central Calaveras fault. The Rogers Creek fault's now starting on the left. The top is the fault surface itself. And the bottom is the ground shaking at the Earth's surface. We're having the earthquake nucleate on the Hayward Fault, and it's propagating towards San Pablo Bay, towards Point Pinole, San Pablo Bay, and the Rogers Creek Fault, going to the northwest. It's encountering the creeping part. It's getting stuck, and it is stopping as it propagates to the northwest. To the southeast, it's aiming towards the central Calaveras Fault. It looks like it might get all the way there, but then it too encounters a creeping section and it is stopped to the southeast. Meanwhile, the waves continue to propagate throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'm going to try to show this movie one more time, but you need to let it run for its full 50 seconds. And maybe I will not because my pointer just disappeared. Okay, I see if it'll let me do it. And it will not. So this movie is also available in the supplement of our 2021 JGR paper. Okay, so let's have a summary. Um, part one, we compared well-recorded magnitude less than 6.7 earthquakes, so magnitude 6.6 six and less on creeping and lock faults. And when we did that, we noticed that they produced similar peak ground accelerations and peak ground velocities and also ruptured similar sized fault areas. The ground motion study is published in a 2014 paper with, uh, that I wrote with Norm Abramson. And then both of these studies are, uh, details of our, and other stuff too, is, is in our, in my uh, large earthquakes and creeping faults reviews of geophysics paper published in 2017. For part two of the talk, we used the dynamic rupture method, spontaneous earthquake rupture method to simulate large earthquakes on some creeping faults in Northern California, the Rogers Creek, Hayward, Calaveras, and Northern Calaveras faults. And some of our simulated earthquakes were stopped by the creeping sections and some weren't. And in uh, tables in the paper, we have lists of what the magnitudes were for these events. They happened to range from magnitude 6.7 to 7.4. And I also have a bunch of information about this study. And important factors that we found were the nucleation site, the fault geometry, and the pattern of fault creep. And please also see our 2021 paper for lots more information and then movies are in the supplements. I wanna give thanks first of all to Joanna um, for hosting me today, thank you very much. And then for funding to the USGS Earthquake Hazards Program, the PG&E CRADA, PG&E USGS Cooperative Research and Development Agreement and my JGR 2021 paper co-authors. And also want to especially thank for the Hayward Project, Bob Simpson, who was my mentor over many years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth. That was uh, really, really interesting um, and a lot of stuff in there. Um, if anyone has any questions, um, please do um, put your hand up uh, through, the, through, through Zoom or type your question into the chat or just say, I want to ask a question in the chat or, or if you just want to speak out, then do whatever is easiest with whatever technology you're using. Um, please do, do ask questions. We have just a few minutes. So if anyone has any burning questions, do, do ask. Uh, Athanasis. Hello, Ruth. Can you hear me? 
Okay, great. Yeah, excellent talk. Thanks very much. Very, very, very nice results. I was wondering, are there any paleoseismic data in any of these creeping faults that perhaps they you could compare the projected slip per event with uh, any of the paleoseismic record? Yeah, that's pretty tough. So um, we do have a really good paleoseismic record, especially for the Hayward fault. Um, mostly we know that there were events there. So Jim Lane Camper did a really nice study and published a number of times in each time adding one or two more events. I think he had up to 12 earthquakes, large earthquakes on the Hayward fault, but I'm not sure. So for those you get slip per event, maybe, 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 but I should, I should look at that. Um, so you would be getting slip for a specific earthquake. Um, I'll have to check that. That that's a good idea. I think that would be the only case you might have a chance. But interestingly, even for the 1868 earthquake, we don't know that much about it. Um, my colleague, late, late colleague Jack Boatwright, studied it um, pretty well, and we know um, like which that it was probably bidirectional, so it went both propagated both ways, just due to the intensity of the ground shaking in both directions. He's able to indirectly measure how strong the ground motion was, but we don't fully even know its rupture extent. And that was for an earthquake that occurred in historic times. Um, but that, that's a good idea though. I, I should go back and read uh, Jim, Jim Lane Campus papers and try to figure out if there's, at least for the points at which he is measuring, if there's a way to see what the maximum slip was and that maybe could help define, yeah, at least for those events, what, what occurred. That's a good idea. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have another question about the, the initial shear stress you put in the model. Okay, if you look at the, the GPS data, I don't, I'm not sure if there are any studies um, that have inverted the GPS data for um, deriving geodetic slip rates. So is there any correlation between low geodetically derived rates and low initial shear stress or anti-correlation? Did you look at that? Maybe. Um, yeah. So the uh, the slip rate models, the interseismic slip rate model that I'm using for the Calaveras, Hayward, and Rogers Creek, although Rogers Creek is pretty is sort of locked in that area. That is all um, geodetic inversions. Um, those are all geodetic inversions. Although there's a little bit of micro seismicity, micro seismicity rate information in some of those. Um, I guess you could turn those into yeah. So. That's kind of what Gareth Funning was doing with some of his modeling. He was uh, taking a, a friction-free surface um, to determine the slip rates. Um, yeah, I guess you could try to get initial shear stress out of that, but it's pretty complicated, especially because we have this compl complex geometry that um, you might get uh, you might get shear stresses that would make it so that ruptures couldn't propagate because it's not just a planar fault surface, it also has bends and branches. So some people use a regional, a regional stress field and then uh, apply those to um, the faults. But for our type of modeling, it doesn't usually doesn't work very well and people end up fiddling a lot with the initial stresses. So whenever you see a published model that's really complicated fault geometry, then they've often had to play around with the initial shear stresses. So just uh, ideally, we would be able to apply a regional stress. And I think I did that um, for a model I published on the 1999 Ismet earthquake published in 2002 in BSSA. But that was pretty rare where that actually almost worked. So usually um, applying the far field uh, stresses does not work super well to produce earthquakes that at least have happened. And then for the future, I, I think uh, it, it might not allow the fault rupture to behave how, how we think it should, but I, ideally we would do it that way if we could, yeah. Okay, thank you very much with great talk. Oh, sure. Thanks, Bye. Thank you, yeah. Ruth, there's a couple of questions. I appreciate we're at time, but there's just a couple of questions in the chat that maybe you can uh, try and address. Um, so one, uh, there's two from Navid Kerast, who says, um, do you think using rate and state friction models would result in a much different result? And would you be able to incorporate the long time creep information with a rate and state model? And then the follow-up is how does the creeping regime affect the rupture velocity? 
Uh, yeah, so um, for starters, uh, yes, rate dependent friction definitely could be used. So the reason that I shied away from it is because it means I just need to assume even more parameters that I don't know the values for. Um, but yes, it absolutely could be used. And Julian Lozos um, was doing a study, I think he hasn't quite fully published it yet, of just the Hayward fault. He was doing this with Gareth Bunning, just looking at the Hayward fault itself using uh, rate state friction, and then trying to um, also look at the app predicted after slip. So that is the tool that would absolutely uh, need to use. Um, for the creeping sections and the, the um, slip, I think you're talking about the rupture velocities uh, in the creeping sections. Uh, yeah, so for those, you could see wherever the rupture contours were bunched up, that meant that the, um, the rupture velocity was slowing. So we did indeed see that, and sometimes um, the creeping sections would slow so much, so the rupture so much that it couldn't even go anywhere anymore. So even for the movie that I was showing, um, the rupture encountered the creeping sections and then it slowed it and then just stopped it. In, in, uh, if we instead used rate dependent friction, I think we would have seen the same thing, but it, it all depends on which parameters you choose for your rate dependent friction, similar to which parameters I choose for my slip weakening friction. So those are kind of still big unknowns. People just kind of pull them out of a hat, the numbers that they use. Um, the coolest way to do it is to have rock mechanics lab experiments on rocks that are collected at depth. So if you have a nice deep borehole, uh, get those rocks up, uh, do some rock, uh, rock mechanics uh, lab experiments on them, and then figure out what their real uh, rate dependent friction value should be. But yes, yes, no, ideally um, this would be done, especially if you're doing a full cycle model or you want to do post seismic slip or um, inter seismic slip, absolutely need to use uh, rate state friction or rate, rate dependent friction. Yeah, so that was a good question. Thanks. Thank you, Ruth. And then final question from Alexandra Hutton. Um, it says, I'm wondering if the rupture boundary constraint shown at the end of your talk can be used in USERF 4 or similar segmentation models. It seems that these results could limit very long ruptures through creeping fault sections. Uh, yes, I hope so. <laughs> yes, thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, so how we parameterize the creeping faults, uh, the creeping parts of the faults makes a big difference. For use of three, I think the models were pretty simple. Also, um, they pretty much assumed, so use of three was the last um, California earthquake probability study that was done. Uh, and then use of four, there's a mention of using many more models instead of uh, using say empirical relations and others. So in USERF 3, most of the faults were assumed that it was assumed that all the creep, almost all the creep was just at the Earth's, almost all at the Earth's surface and not so much at depth. But I would think that these types of models uh, could be helpful in uh, revising a at least a little bit of how we understand the creeping fault mechanisms. But we still uh, will need to you know, figure out which are the appropriate dynamic rupture types of simulations to use and what should our initial, especially our initial stresses and friction parameterizations be. Yeah, so I, I, hope, I hope that this would be useful for you so far. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, it's been a really interesting talk and thank you for the questions and all the answers to the questions as well. Um, so what I'd like to do is now do a final thank you to Ruth Harris for her talk today on creeping faults. And I look forward to seeing you all uh, next time at our next event. So thank you again and bye everyone.